Okay guys, so this lecture is going to go over some of the evidence that's used to support the theory of evolution, um, how fossils are formed, how the fossil record fits into the theory of evolution, um, and some of the other things that are used to uh, support the theory of evolution um, that have been found throughout the history. So to understand evolution, um, we really need to take a look at paleontology um, and fossils. Um, studying fossils um, is a really good way to look at animals and how they've changed over time. Um, the animals that exist today um, on the planet did uh, evidence supports that they didn't just really appear um, at one spontaneous point in time. There was no uh, poof, um, and then the animals that we know today, giraffes, zebras, lions, things like that, um, were just here um, in their exact same form, the same way that they are now as they were hundreds of billions of years ago, or hundreds of millions of years ago, excuse me, um, when the Earth was formed. <coughs> Instead... <coughs> What we see um, is a change over time um, from animals being a kind of a very simplistic form of themselves. Um, so you would see very, a very simple frog kind of thing, or very simplistic amphibian. It has maybe a um, little tiny little legs with very small little nubby fingers, um, and it's not capable of staying out of the water very long. Very simple form of itself. Uh, maybe it has like a, maybe it doesn't even have legs. Maybe it just kind of has like nubs or something like that. Um, so, um, and then what you see through the study of fossils, um, looking through the fossil record, is the um, newer in time we get, the earlier um, towards us, the newer um, in time we get towards us, the closer in time, I should say, um, that you get towards modern day um, uh, fossil record, the model, modern day period, um, fossils get more complex. So you'll see that little amphibian go from having no legs at all to maybe tiny little nub legs, um, and those nub legs will become uh, larger legs. Um, and then you'll see the different forms, and eventually you'll see the uh, uh, current day amphibians. You don't just see um, current day amphibians uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago in the fossil record. Um, what you do see, though, um, like I said, are simplistic versions that are very similar um, to the animals that we have now, just kind of a simpler version. Um, and since that's the uh, how that works, the theory of superposition, um, animals as we go back in time become simpler, um, it's easy to understand the fossil record um, with this kind of concept in mind, that the farther you go back in time, um, the more simplistic you should find um, animals to be. So, um, the way that we study animals in the past, obviously, are fossils. Um, so, we take uh, our fossils that we find in the ground today, um, and we compare them to current uh, living species. Um, so, you can look at the anatomy of the uh, animals, and we can reconstruct how the uh, muscles would have worked, uh, how the muscle, where the muscles would have attached, and things like that, the jaw structures, the teeth structures, eye structures, and things like that inside of the uh, um, skulls, based on muscle attachment points and things like that. Anatomists are able to tell all that stuff, um, and we once we put all that information together, um, we can reconstruct what that animal looked like. Um, everything but really the outside, the like skin covering kind of thing. Some of those we can, which you've, uh, I'll show you in a second, which is cool, um, down to everything but color, which is even uh, more impressive. Um, but anyway, um, so we take all these fossil reconstructions, um, and we look at that, and we compare all that information of how tall, how many teeth, blah, 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 things like that, um, to modern-day living animals. Um, and when we compare them to those modern-day living animals, you'll see similarities between them, differences and things like that. Um, and all of those similarities and differences and things allow us to reconstruct their evolutionary history. Um, so you can see where birds uh, split from uh, um, reptiles and things along the evolutionary tree, uh, where mammals and amphibians split along the evolutionary tree and things like that. Um, so you, they use fossil records uh, to scientists to establish all this stuff going back in time and um, looking as traits disappear. So uh, we have us, the quote-unquote most complex, um, and then we go back in time and kind of watch traits that make us human um, kind of disappear. Um, and watch the gorilla become a little less gorilla until we find a modern day, uh, a, a common ancestor back in time, um, where that organism splits, where both of those fossils um, come into one fossil record. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so being able to reconstruct the fossil record um, is a very important um, um, supporting uh, evidence for evolution. So these are some really important fossils um, and the ways that the fossil records used to support the theory of evolution. Um, so one of them over here you can see is a horse, and this is a very common um, way to explain evolution. So down here back in time, this was uh, a couple hundred millions of years ago, 
Um, this horse was about the size. This is a primitive horse, a very simplistic version of a horse. Um, and it's very small. It's about the size of a small um, dog, maybe a large house cat kind of thing. Um, they're brown. They have darker brown, maybe black stripes somewhere around in there, more than likely, um, to blend in with the forest. Um, the ecosystem and the environment that they lived in had a uh, little bit of undercover grass, kind of very similar to the forest that we have find around here now, um, with tall trees and things like that, a little bit of undergrowth. So um, these small animals, these small horse-like organisms, you don't find modern-day horses in the fossil records. You only find these little guys. Um, so anyway, um, you can see it looks like a horse. Its skull is very similar to a horse. It has kind of a very similar leg structure to a horse. But anyway, one of the main differences is this guy has four toes. So this, these four toes, um, as this organism ran across the ground, um, these four toes would provide traction, uh, a little more grip, um, and allow it to increase its speed um, as it ran along the ground. So um, it didn't really need to run very fast um, because there were trees, there's undergrowth and things like that. You're not going to be running very quickly because if you do, um, these little toes will get snagged in uh, gnarls and branches and things like that um, and potentially get broken and things like that. So this little guy probably walked around in the forest um, and ran if he absolutely had to. He probably behaved very similar um, to little small animals called uh, dyke dykes um, and things like that, little small deer-like organisms um, that live in South Asia. Um, very small little, uh, little small organisms like that. So anyway, um, so he had four toes, um, a very small organism. So anyway, as the environment uh, shifted, um, the trees started to um, go away, um, and the uh, environment started to be replaced with a little more grasslands. Now in this case, um, as you are t a small little organism, the horse, um, there's variation between these species. Some of them are going to be taller, um, some of them are going to be shorter, some of them are going to have longer toes, shorter toes, just like us with our finger lengths some and toe lengths and things. Some of you have really long toes, some of us have short toes. Um, so that was existed in these uh, uh, early horse species as well. Um, differences in toe length and height and things like that. Well, anyway, as the environment shifted and the trees started to get shorter um, and the grassland started to get taller, um, you needed to be able to see over the grass. Um, if you can't see over the grass, predators can sneak up on you. I mean, you can't see them coming, so you need to be able to um, see over the grass. So over time, the horses that were taller um, were able to survive. The shorter horses were eaten. Um, they couldn't survive. They could not see over the grass. Predators would get them. Um, so the horses that were slightly taller would breed with horses that were slightly taller, um, leading to a slightly taller um, horse uh, evolution step. Um, the species as a whole would grow taller. The toes, uh, on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, running around with all these toes is not really the best idea ever. Um, they will, can get snagged on things, they break easily, um, and an animal with a broken uh, toe, broken uh, part of its bone, is not a good thing to have. Um, that's a, a pretty much a death sentence. So as the grasslands expanded, you need the need to run faster um, and farther distances. Um, you couldn't really hide between the trees. Um, became larger. So organisms that had shorter toes that were less likely to get um, their toes broken and die from infection and things like that um, would pass their genes on, um, and eventually the toes would become shorter over time. As the grasslands continued to grow taller and the trees continued to grow shorter, the horses continued to grow taller as well. They needed to see over the grass, um, less trees. You don't need to worry about um, hiding in the trees anymore, so you can grow quite large. The toes became shorter and shorter as they needed to run farther and longer distances um, until eventually what happened is those toes were um, got lost. The information, uh, the genetic information for those toes is still found in modern day horses, which is very interesting. Uh, modern day horses will sometimes grow those extra two toes on either side of their feet. Um, sometimes it does happen, it's still there, um, which begs the question of why would a modern day horse, um, if it was um, brought forth into existence in its current form, have the information to grow extra toes if it never had them in the first place? Um, a very interesting thing to think about. Well, anyway, um, the information for that toes, uh, those toes eventually became so short, so short, so short, so short. Um, as the uh, horse progressed through evolutionary time until the toes were no longer needed um, and they were no longer produced. They were essentially uh, became so small that eventually they were no longer needed and they were no longer going to be um, produced uh, on the body, organism's body. Um, so you can see that as we progress through time, the horse gets taller 
um, to compensate for the uh, needing to see over the grasslands. Um, his toes get shorter for the ability to run farther um, until you reach the current horse that we have today, our modern day horse as you know it now. I um, mean, they stand on their middle finger. Um, essentially, they, if you put your finger um, down and you put your finger, uh, put you uh, fold, fit, fold your middle finger in half, um, they stand on that knuckle. Your middle finger is essentially what they stand on. Um, very odd way to stand. So you can see in their fossil record, they used to be significantly shorter. Um, with much uh, different feet. Um, and as we go through fossil history, you can see the um, progression of this very clear um, change uh, of their skulls getting longer um, and taller, their toes um, going smaller um, until eventually they left. You can watch the hoof get larger as they put more and more pressure on one foot um, and things like that till you reach the modern day horse. Now the modern day horse is not the end of evolution. Um, this horse will continue to change for um, the foreseeable future, um, essentially until time itself ex uh, ceases to exist or the earth exists and the species becomes extinct anyway. Now over here we have the uh, uh, fossil record of whales um, as well as uh, nautilus uh, and things like that. Um, so nautilus are essentially like deep sea snails and you can see the uh, fossil record and evolution of their sh uh, shells which is interesting. So whales um, at one point in time, the ancestors of whales walked on land. They were about the size of a coyote, a um, large dog kind of thing. They walked along the uh, um, edge of the shore um, on the ocean. Um, there's not a lot of predators on the shoreline, um, but there is a lot of food. Uh, it's open space. You can see for a long distance. So you can run if you need to. And there's a lot of food in the ocean. Um, essentially, evolution is powered by the need to get away from competition. Um, if you're being competed with, um, if somebody's trying to seal your food, you want to go somewhere else where you can have your own food um, or somebody's not trying to eat you or things like that. So um, animals that have pressure on them to um, um, evolve essentially have to um, survive, have to go somewhere else. Um, they want to find an environment that's unique, um, that nobody else is at yet because there's no competition there. If you can go to a place like the seashore um, where, people, uh, where other animals haven't found yet um, and you can go, oh, this is all my food. Um, you can evolve there very easily um, without a lot of competition. So um, what essentially would happen way back in time is when uh, there weren't a lot of animal species evolved yet, um, there were a lot of environments for them to expand into, so um, it happened a lot more often than it does today. A lot of the environments tend to be filled because it's uh, been quite a while, <laughs> a couple billion years um, in the evolutionary time scale. Well, anyway, um, so this guy walked along the uh, uh, shore of the ocean, and he would chase little crabs and fish like that. Um, well, eventually, as more and more organisms moved on to the shoreline for competition, um, he needed to be able to catch more and more food. Um, so if he could go into the water just a little bit, that would give him an edge. If you couldn't go into the water but I could, I'm going to get more food than you can because you're going to eat the food on the shore and I have to compete with you for that. But if I can go out just a little bit farther in the ocean and you can't, I can get the food that you can't reach. So as they went farther out into the ocean, um, they became a little longer, a little more alligator-like. You can kind of see that. Um, their legs became shorter, a little more squat. Um, their legs became a little more powerful and a little more flat um, to allow them uh, more uh, flipper-like feet to propel themselves in the water. Um, a longer, more streamlined body was evolved, a stronger tail to help aid in paddling, kind of like an otter. Um, so whales are mammals. Keep that in mind. They do produce milk. They breathe oxygen. Um, so... Um, at one point in time, um, it would make uh, perfect sense um, that they uh, were mammals on land as well. well anyway, um, so as they progressed forward through time, um, they would spend more and more time in the water. Um, it would make more sense. I don't have to compete with anybody. I don't need to go back on land. There's a lot of competition on land. If I can just stay in the water and eat um, all the food in the water, um, hey, that's good for me. I don't have to compete with anybody. So that's essentially what happened. Um, and as they essentially spent more and more time in the water, their bodies became more and more um, uh, um, adapted um, to that aquatic environment. As you can see, they became longer, their skulls became longer, um, and essentially they became, uh, uh, their uh, arms became flippers, greatly reduced and flattened and things like that. And we'll talk about the uh, unique shape of their hands later, and that's a very interesting concept, um, until you reach modern day whales. And one of the interesting things about whales um, is that all modern day whales, not all of them, but most of them, have a pelvis. Um, so modern day whales 
Um, if once again, if they were created or are brought forth into existence um, at their current day state, um, poof, here's a whale um, as it is now, why would you have a pelvis? I mean, if you never walked on land, if you never had back legs, why would you need a pelvis? Why would it be there? Um, this pelvis serves very little function in whales. It doesn't really do anything at all. It's just there. Um, and essentially what it is is it's a greatly reduced leftover uh, pelvis through the fossil record. Um, as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we go through the evolutionary time, um, essentially this is what's just left over the remnants. Um, it's essentially what happened to the toes over here. They got smaller and smaller until eventually they went away. Um, and over the uh, couple million more years, essentially the uh, whale population will no longer produce um, pelvises as they essentially go away. Um, but they still produce pelvises now um, because at one point in time their ancestors had back legs um, that were attached with a pelvis. So they still have pelvises with those attachment points for their legs. They just don't produce legs. So very interesting concept with their pelvises here. Um, and then you can see the fossil record for humans. Um, our fossil brains, um, way back in time, uh, were very condensed, very short. Um, a mutation took place um, in our, one of our ancient ancestors that um, allowed the uh, muscle tissue inside of our uh, jaws to be greatly reduced. The tendons um, inside of our brain tissue um, were greatly reduced when that mutation and that uh, gene, partic gene, particular gene took place. Um, and when that did, the uh, muscle structures were greatly, uh, the pressure was greatly reduced on our brain case, um, which allowed the skulls to grow significantly larger, um, and the brain inside could grow significantly larger too. Um, so you can uh, look that one up if you want to for a little more information on it, or feel free to uh, email me and I'll expand on this concept. Very interesting um, little uh, evolutionary concept here of the evolution of the human brain. But anyway, um, so you can watch the human uh, skull uh, progress through time very clear progression um, of hominid ancestors up until modern day humans here in and you can watch um, the eyes become farther apart set the cheekbones become farther apart set um, the jaws become uh, less protruded out and become a little farther back set as we progress through um, the fossil record you can watch the uh, brain case become larger and wider up here and you can watch, so watch it become more offset in the back as the uh, organisms become more and more upright walking until you reach modern day humans. Um, so very, very, very interesting um, with the fossil records here. So you can see the geologic time scale here. Um, and you can see here um, uh, 2.5 billion years ago, um, the Archaean or, uh, period uh, pretty much ended where uh, the uh, eukaryotes uh, essentially came onto existence here. Prior to that, it was essentially archaea and bacteria that were around. Uh, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth formed. Um, and then you can see the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic eras, um, and then the um, um, epochs in between. Um, so over here, you can see the organisms that existed um, during what particular time periods on the Earth. And you can see down here in the Cambrian, everything was essentially in the ocean. Um, very s small, simplistic, um, little bug-like organisms like trilobites lived in the ocean. Um, as you progress farther, you see um, fish kind of things start to evolve, um, small primitive insects, um, and then land plants, um, and uh, larger uh, moving onto the uh, uh, land arthropods um, and things like that. Um, and then arthropods that have moved significantly onto the land, you can see the continents start to separate during the end of the Paleozoic. Um, then you can see the uh, um, evolution of flying insects, evolution of seeds, um, Dinosaurs uh, started to evolve in the Jurassic period. They were around a little earlier than that, just very primitive um, lizards and things like that. Um, this was the height of the dinosaurs in the Jurassic and Mesozoic era. Um, and then flight bir uh, flighted birds with feathers as we know them today evolved in that time period, flowering plants. Um, and then we reach the modern day era um, where organisms that we start to recognize um, today started to evolve, the age of mammals. Um, so this is the... Uh, um, concept of superposition again as you go back in time you can see the uh, um, progression uh, from simplistic to more complex um, or excuse me as you go forward in time I should say so anyway let's talk about fossils so fossils um, once again like I talked about allow us to understand how organisms moved um, what their bodies looked like how their muscles functioned and things like that um, back in time I mean that information allows it to compare allows scientists to compare it to current day animals and organisms to discover who was essentially related to who, how certain traits evolved, what uh, traits were found in what areas, 
Um, most of the tr things that you see today is uh, eyeballs and flights and things um, didn't just have w one thing that worked. There were 40 million versions of uh, birds that didn't work out um, until eventually one of them um, worked and eventually uh, that one kind of uh, led to um, the evolution of the rest of the uh, flight and ancestors and things like that. Um, that kind of recipe evolved, but there were 14 bajillion failed ones out there as well. So um, studying fossils allows you to see all the failed attempts and things like that. Well, anyway, um, this guy right here, uh, Tillatac, a very important fossil. Um, a lot of the time, one of the concepts that's levied against the uh, theory of evolution is a, a, um, a hardcore challenge is uh, where are the transition fossils kind of thing. Um, and as close as you're ever going to get to a transitional fossil, they're not real things. You're never going to see a half bird, half fish kind of thing. They're just not. It's just a kind of a, a myth, kind of a... a, a Someone who doesn't understand evolution argues for that. But this is really the closest you're ever going to get um, to what's termed a real missing link um, or a real um, transitional, uh, a most missing link kind of thing. Um, so this guy right here, Tiktaalik. Um, Tiktaalik's pretty cool. Um, he was predicted um, in early uh, 1990. Uh, the 1990s, um, using the uh, evolutionary theory, um, scientists were able to look at um, all of the modern-day organisms and the fossils that had currently been found, and they were able to take all that information and go back in time and essentially pick a date of like 300 million years ago or whatever, um, and go, I think that at this point in time, um, organisms um, on the evolutionary history looked like this, um, they would function like this, they would be found during this particular time period at this point on the earth and things like that. Um, so essentially the scientists stated that they drew what they thought Tiktaalik would look like, they named it Tiktaalik, um, they stated where Tiktaalik was going to be um, found on the earth and what time period back in the uh, fossil record it's, um, he would be found um, and things like that and even essentially where on the planet he would be found. So in 2000, or they even uh, went as far as drawing, a, making a model of him, um, which was really cool before they even, uh, uh, before this. So anyway, um, they didn't even know he existed. They had never found him. They didn't know where he was. They just thought they knew. They made a prediction using the evolutionary theory. And then in 2006, um, these guys got funding to go do their research. Um, so they went to a place in Canada um, that fit their criteria. It was around during the time period. It had a certain environment that they were looking for um, and things like that. So they dug for about 45 minutes in this area, and they found exactly what they were looking for. It looked exactly like they thought it would. It functioned exactly like they said it would. And that's really, really interesting. That's the hallmark of a good theory, um, is these guys were able to predict what organisms would look like in the past and then actually go find that organism, um, and it looked exactly like they thought it would. I um, mean, that's very interesting. So Tiktaalik, um, what he is, is he's about the closest you're ever going to get to a half-and-half half organism. So this guy is essentially a half-fish, half-reptile kind of thing. He is a fish. He's a true fish. Um, but he does have primitive lungs, um, and he does have primitive legs um, that he could use to kind of push himself out of the water um, and walk around with, maybe uh, shuffle around on the land. Um, he could, you could see his eyes are on the top of his head. There's are his eyes there. Um, so he could probably and probably did push his head out of the water, very similar to an alligator. Um, and he could look out of the water and poke his eyes out and look around. Um, so he's kind of the very first um, step as, uh, as from organisms taking the um, first st steps, if you like, from the water to the land. Um, so this guy was probably one of the very first organisms to do one of those things. He was uh, either the very first, one of the very first organisms to be able to um, use his legs, very similar to um, modern day walking animals. Um, he, they are fins, they're modified fins, but he could use them like, kind of like legs. Um, his, he does have the ability to look out of the water. Um, he can breathe air with those modified lungs, um, and it's thought that he could probably uh, shuffle around or maybe kind of, uh, sort of, sort of, kind of walk um, from place to place on the ground. Um, so, very interesting organism, Tiktaalik here. Um, kind of the closest you're ever going to get to a half and half organism. So, kind of the very primitive ancestor um, to most modern day reptiles was this guy right here, Tiktaalik. So let's talk about fossils. 
um, what the different types of fossils are. There's five main different types, um, how they're formed, um, and essentially what the type of information that you get from each type of fossil um, and what it's useful for. So the, probably the most familiar type of fossil to people um, is something called a compression fossil. So essentially what's going to happen is an organism is going to um, die and it's going to have to die in the water. Um, so things like fish or uh, something dies and falls in the pond or something like that. Um, so essentially um, that organism, uh, you can see here a little frog, a fish, a, a plant, whatever it is is going to sink down to the bottom of the water. Um, and there's going to have to be mud on the ground on the bottom of that lake or a pond or whatever it is. So essentially what's going to happen is over time, uh, sediment, uh, more mud and things like that, more uh, dirt and stuff is going to be washed over the to uh, top of that organism or that little uh, plant fossil or whatever, or plant or whatever it is. Um, and it's going to build up over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and once it starts to build up, it's going to essentially trap um, whatever that little organism is um, in mud, kind of mummifying it, if you like. And now, over time, um, all of that pressure from that weight of the mud is going to build up on top um, of that fossil, uh, that little organism, and essentially it's going to squish it, compressing it um, into a little flat uh, disc, a little flat version of itself, a uh, squished little flat fossil, um, and uh, the f organism itself is going to uh, rot away, the soft tissue, the bones and things are going to be replaced um, by minerals um, in the water and things like that. Um, so if you know how stalactites form, the slow uh, leaching of minerals and uh, leaves behind uh, minerals and things like that. Um, so the bones and soft tissues decay um, and the bones are replaced uh, through the leaching of minerals and things um, by rock. So what you're left with over a couple hundred millions of years um, are organisms that leave behind a flat version of what they looked like. Um, so what you have is a fish that's been essentially ironed and squished 100% uh, flat, but you can see um, what its bo body looked like. You can see um, structures inside of its scales, um, its fins. You can see how many bones it had. You can see where its eyes were, its gills here. Um, you can see what type of fins it has. You can see this fossil uh, fossil frog's um, bones and to what type of bones and things like that. I mean, you can also just kind of see what the whole organism is, and that's really cool. So very interesting type of uh, fossils, uh, compression fossils. Petrifaction fossils, or petrification fossils, um, are probably the most familiar fossils um, to people when you think of dinosaurs. Um, so these are the things that you see in museums, the big impressive fossils and things like that. Um, so petrifaction fossils uh, form exactly like uh, compression fossils, sans the getting squished part. Um, so an organism dies, and it's going to be very quickly covered up um, by uh, dirt and mud and things like that. Um, so in this case, the b bone, the hard tissue, the uh, um, uh, soft tissue, the uh, muscle tissue and things like that, eyeballs, brains, um, are going to rot away. And the hard tissues, the bony uh, things, teeth and things like that, calcified uh, substances, um, are going to have the uh, minerals inside of them are going to be replaced by minerals in the uh, water as it leaches through um, and things from the environment, uh, slowly leaving behind rock, the same way that forms stalagmites. Um, and eventually what you're uh, left with is a total replacement of the original bone skull um, in the form of rock. So essentially all of the bone has been replaced with rock. So this is a rock version um, of what that original T-Rex skull looked like. Um, so this gives you a three-dimensional structure um, of what the organism looked like. You can actually see f uh, physical size from distances and things, how tall it was, how wide it was, and things like that, um, how large the teeth were instead of just a flattened version um, of itself. Um, so this way you can see how um, actual structures on the bones, um, very interesting way to reconstruct. Um, you can see here this organism had some sort of uh, structures next to its teeth. Um, this T-Rex, who knows what those were. You can see where muscle attachments were. Very interesting um, way to study organisms and very, very useful um, type of fossils. Essentially what's going to happen um, is this giant fossil um, here, this uh, rock skull will be encased in another giant rock. Um, so they have to dig the fossil skull out um, of the other giant rock that they're encased in, which seems very unfun. 
impression fossils. Now, impression fossils are essentially stamps. Um, an organism is going to die um, and be uh, uh, squished itself, or die, excuse me, uh, on some very soft mud. Um, and when that organism dies, the mud that it's in is going to cast an impression or squish an impression um, of whatever um, that organism looked like or whatever happened to have been there um, on the surface of that mud. That mud then dries and hardens into solid rock. Um, so this is Dinosaur State Park. This is, I think it's in Utah. Um, you can go see it. And these are dinosaur footprints walking through mud. This was a, um, a riverbed a couple hundred million years ago, and there's thousands of dinosaur footprints. This is just a very small example um, walking through that riverbed. Um, it dried up over the t uh, couple the millennia, um, and the dinosaurs that just so happened to have been walking around inside of it, um, their footprints are left there, which is very cool. You can actually go see real dinosaur footprints in the mud. Um, and that's an impression foot fossil, so you can see how um, their feet were really shaped with the fleshy parts um, on them. You can see the uh, um, actual size of that organism's foot um, instead of just the bone. Um, and we have to reconstruct what the muscle looked like and things as well. Um, so you can see here, this is an impression fossil of actual dinosaur skin. Um, so we can actually see what the uh, texture um, and pattern um, of actual dinosaur skin looked like um, impressed into mud, which is really cool. And over here, this is a petrifaction fossil of Archaeopteryx, a very cool flying uh, reptile. It's not a bird. Um, he has teeth, which is one of the differences between birds and reptiles. Reptiles have teeth, birds don't. Um, but the impression part are the feathers. Um, without this form of fossil, impression fossil, you would just have the bony structure here. You wouldn't know that this organism had feathers. Um, you would think that it was simply just another dinosaur um, that had uh, scaly skin like this. Um, but instead, um, the impression of the feathers that are left behind in the mud allows us to know that this entire organism had feathery wings here, um, a long feathered tail, five feathers all over his entire body. And you can see um, the impressions, even the size of the feathers right there. You can see the individual feathers um, that are left behind on the impression of the mud. Now, this is a gliding reptile, not a bird. We have cast fossils. Um, now, if you know anything about casting um, uh, clay, um, or pots or anything like that. This is essentially the lost wax technique, um, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, that's okay, I'll go over it real quick. Um, essentially how this works, um, you take a positive structure. So um, we have an actual living uh, snail. The actual living snail here is going to die and sink into some soft mud. Uh, now what's going to happen um, is that little organism is going to be left inside of that soft mud. The soft mud's going to harden. And inside of that hard mud shell is that little soft-bodied organism. That little soft-bodied organism is going to be decaying away. Um, and then the uh, hole that's left inside, the cavity um, inside of that hard mud, um, is going to look exactly like um, the structure of that little organism um, inside of it. That little hole is then eventually going to be filled up with a different type of rock or mud or something like that, um, which is going to harden um, later and leave behind a cast um, of what that organism looked like um, when it was alive. So once again, this is the lost wax technique. Um, Google that one on YouTube if you'd like. Um, once again, I'll post a little supplemental video on this one as well, um, and you can watch how these fossils form using the lost wax technique. It's essentially the same thing. Um, a negative form, a positive form here, the um, little snail um, is going to be uh, used to make a negative form inside of the rock I and mean, the negative uh, form is going to be filled up with uh, some more mud to create another positive form. So we have your trilobite over here. Um, and Indian money, these are um, little uh, worm tubes, um, if you want to know what those are. Um, and then the last one, the most interesting one, is intact uh, preservation. Now, intact preservation is very, very rare. Um, it's, the conditions have to form or have to be perfect um, for these type of uh, fossils to be found. Um, so intact preservation is essentially um, an organism's going to die, and very quickly after its death, um, it's going to be entrapped in some sort um, of, uh, entombed, I should say, in some sort of substance, which is going to instantaneously stop the decay or drastically slow it. Um, so you can see here we have a lizard 
one that's been encased in amber, which is hardened tree sap. So this poor little lizard was probably eating a bug, which had gotten stuck in some amber, a little tree sap, um, liquid tree sap. He got stuck in the tree sap himself, got very quickly covered in more tree sap. Um, that tree sap then hardened around him, turning into amber, and he was trapped inside. Um, so you actually can see um, the physical structure of an intact formed. You can see the skin. You can see the body um, of what that lizard looked like um, from 300 million years ago inside of a piece of amber. Now here we have a, um, a, a bison um, that's found in the La Brea tar pits. Um, he fell in the tar and was found in intact, essentially mummified um, in the tar pits, which is very, very cool. Um, this species went extinct about ten to 12,000 years ago, um, but we can see what it looked like, how large it was, what its skin color looked like, what type of hair he had, um, and things like that, because he fell in the tar pit in uh, La Brea, California, was covered in tar. Um, the tar trapped all of the uh, um, substance and kept all the oxygen and bacteria out, um, and he didn't decay. And we dug him up a couple hundred thousand years later, or a couple uh, tens of 12,000 12, years later, and here we are. Over here, you have a baby mammoth. Um, it died about 50, 60,000 years ago um, in Siberia, and he f died and was frozen in the permafrost, and essentially he stayed in the freezer for 50, 60,000 years. Um, they found him when the permafrost started to thaw out, um, and we found a fully frozen, intact little baby mammoth from 50, 60,000 years ago. You can even see the hair, um, which is really cool, and you can see some beetles down here, which are trapped in coal. Um, or lava dust as well, um, lava, I and mean, things like that, which are trapped in intact preservation. So intact preservation is very, very cool. Um, gives us a lot of information as to what those organisms looked like. So, now the fossil record is not a perfect thing. Um, this is one of the, the uh, double-edged bladed, uh, double -edged swords of the uh, evolutionary theory. Um, the fossil record is not complete. And the fact that the fossil record is not complete can be used to argue against the theory of evolution. Um, we don't have every single step in the fossil record, so how do we know what organisms really looked like? You don't have all the steps from A to B, or A to Z, um, but we do have A, F, uh, G, H, I, J, uh, M, N, O, P, Q, R, T, U, V kind of thing, uh, W, X, Z. Um, so we have most of it, but not all of it. Um, and the problem with that is, and the very easy answer to that is, most organisms that ever existed didn't fossilize. You have to have bones or something hard about you to fossilize. Um, it's very rare for things like jellyfish or worms that are very soft and squishy on the inside. They don't have bones um, to fossilize. They don't really have a lot to fossilize. They're very brittle. They're very delicate. Um, so it's very hard for them to form fossils. So we just don't have a lot of fossils of those type of organisms. And the formation of fossils is pretty rare in the first place. Um, think about the fact that millions of organisms uh, die every single day, um, and the vast overwhelming majority of them essentially will be um, decay away, um, be eaten, um, is carrion or things like that, and 99.99999 repeating, um, I would eventually probably almost say it's probably 100 to the essentially minus 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 repeating 1 um, percent of those will never become fossils. Um, so it's unlikely for things to become fossils. Um, so fossils are just hard to find. Um, and also, there's no telling what's at the bottom of the ocean. Um, we can't get down there and look. Organisms have died and gone to the bottom of the ocean throughout history. Um, the ocean's where life evolved. Um, so if we could get down there and look, who knows what we'd find. We just can't look. Also, what's in the middle of mountains? Um, we can't go in there and look either. So we just don't know um, what's out there. Um, Natural disasters destroy fossils, erosion destroys things, um, so there's no telling what's lost, there's no telling what's out there. Um, so, the fossil record is not complete. Um, and it's been known for a really long time that the fossil record is not complete. Um, in fact, Charles Darwin even wrote about it in The Origin of Species, you can see that over here. Um, geology uh, assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain as this, perhaps is the most obvious, serious objection which can be urged against the theory of evolution. The explanation for this, I believe, uh, lies in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. Um, now, this was written in 1856. Um, we have learned a lot more about evolution since then, um, but even Charles Darwin knew that back in the day, um, people were going to use the fact that we didn't have every single fossil um, to argue against the theory of evolution. Um, now, once again, 
Um, you have to think about it in real terms here. We go to court, people are convicted all day long um, on cases that we know they did um, without all of the evidence. Um, and this is a perfect example of that as well. We have 99.9, .9, maybe probably 95% um, percent of the evidence um, to support this. Um, so pretty uh, sure that that theory um, is a good one. So how do we know how old fossils are? Well, there's two ways to tell how old a fossil is. Um, and the, the, um, one of them um, is a little more useful than the other, but they're both, uh, they're both useful to uh, certain degrees. So relative dating and absolute dating. Oops, sorry, so relative dating um, is using the concept of superposition. How do we know how old the fossil is? Well, how old is that layer of rock? Well, you go back and see how old the layer of rock is, and you see what type of fossils are in there, and that's how old you know how old the fossil is. Well, how old do you know the fossil is? Well, what layer of rock is it in? How old do you know what layer of rock it is? Well, where are the fossils found at? Kind of a, a circle that loops back on itself. Um, we know how old the rocks are because of the fossils found in it. And we know how old the fossils are because of how old the rock layer is. Kind of an odd concept. Um, so it's superposition. And the other way is absolute dating. Um, and this is going to give you a specific date. Um, an absolute dating, a radiometric dating, I'm just going to look at the concept of half-lives, um, the decay of radioactive isotopes. Um, so isotopes are different versions of atoms, um, things like carbon. So carbon has 12 um, nu neutrons inside of it, um, and on normal uh, carbon, I should say, carbon-12. Um, carbon-16, carbon-14, things are isotopes of carbon that have different numbers of neutrons. Um, uh, sorry, it has seven uh, neutrons, sorry, not uh, six neutrons in normal, seven uh, for an isotope or eight for an isotope. Well, anyway, those isotopes, um, you acquire those isotopes over a certain amount of time. Um, we know what that rate is throughout time, how much you acquire throughout your life period, uh, lifetime, and kind of things like that, what the rate of acquisition is. Um, so we also know how quickly those isotopes, isotopes don't like to be isotopes, they want to get back to being carbon-12, they don't like to be carbon-15, 16, 17, or whatever, um, they want to get back to being carbon-12. So we also know how quickly um, they turn back into carbon-12. Um, so if you know all this information, um, you can look at it and go, oh, well this organism had this much carbon-12 when it died, or carbon-14 I should say. Um, it's been, how much does it have now? Well it has this much now. Well, we can go back in time. It had this much to start with. It has this much now. You can do some math using the formulas of half-lives, how much of it decays, how quickly it decays, and figure out when that organism died, um, which is very cool. Now, there are uh, carbon dating is one of those things that's uh, out there that people like to throw around for the concept uh, uh, to argue against the theory of evolution as well. Um, carbon dating is only useful for organisms that were once alive. Um, you can't carbon date a rock. Um, it has to be a living organism. I mean, you can carbon date a rock, but it's going to give you like 14 billion years, um, or you know, it might give you 500 years, which is uh, never reliable because it's only useful for living organisms. So um, that's one of the things that people tend to not know about carbon dating um, when they go in to use it. Um, so there's about 60 or 70 different types of isotopes um, that we can use to uh, date fossils and date rocks and things like that, um, and they all spit out a very specific date. Um, that uh, is always the same. So all 60, 70 tests spit out the exact same dates um, within about a 50 to 60 million year time range. Um, and if you think about the fact that Earth's been around for 4.5 billion years, 4.6 billion years, 5, 50, 60 million years is a pretty good time, uh, pretty good average. Um, 50, 60 million years out of 4.5 billion years is not a very long time period. Um, so that's a really good um, average. Uh, for spitting out uh, the same dates. Um, so radio at, uh, metric dating, um, absolute dating is a very useful tool, um, figuring out the dates of fossils and things like that. Um, so here's the concept again. Um, you watch the parent isotope decay into its daughter isotope and you find that rate. Um, and then you can do some math and things like that to figure out how um, long that organism has been dead. So carbon dating here, same concept. Um, you can read over that one. Carbon dating works by breaking down carbon-14 um, into carbon-12 again. And you can see um, the uptake of carbon-14. You can uh, see over here we uptake carbon-14 from everything that we do, from breathing to eating. Um, and when you die, you stop uptaking that carbon-14. Um, it's going to decay um, over, over time, and we can watch that decay. 
So another way to uh, evolution is used, or another uh, thing that's used to support um, the theory of evolution, um, are biogeography and looking at fossils that are found um, across the globe. So if you know anything about plate tectonics, you know that the all the continents on the planet um, were once one giant supercontinent called Pangaea. They were all connected. Now, since all of those um, continents were connected, the environments that were on that one giant continent were pretty similar. Um, and also, all the organisms that were on that giant continent were also very similar, and they could get from one place to the other. Um, and that makes perfect sense. It's all connected. So, what you also see are um, the continents pretty much fit together really well, and you can see the edges of the continents fit back into a, themselves, kind of like a giant jigsaw puzzle really well. well anyway, <clears throat> there are also things called key fossils that are found on these areas that add more evidence um, to the theory of evolution. So, what you find are key fossils that are found on both continents. When South America and Africa joined, or were connected, um, in the same time period, if you go back on and do fossil digs, um, you will find the exact same fossil organisms on both continents in the exact same time periods. And prior to the fact of when they broke apart, you'll find a lot of fossils like that on both areas. Once they break apart, however, you don't see that anymore. The organisms stay separate. You don't see that crossing over. You see an organism over here that evolves into something separate, and the same thing over here. You don't see that double thing here. Also, the question arises is, why would they be in both if they were never connected? Not only does that rely with... Um, uh, this little uh, lizard here, there are quite a number of them. Plants are found all across Antarctica, Africa, South America, the exact same fossil species of plants. Um, India has fossil um, reptiles. Um, South America and Africa have a couple. Um, that explains why things like oak trees um, and um, elm trees are dispersed all across the entire globe. I mean, why species have very similar-looking ancestors um, or similar-looking relatives, like brown bears in um, South America look very similar to North American black bears and things like that, and Indian black bears. Uh, Asia has black bears as well. I mean, that explains why organisms exist um, in the places that they do. Um, because at one point in time, they all had access to these places, um, and once they broke apart, the organisms tended to evolve or uh, evolved separately from one another um, in their new environments. So plate tectonics, you can see the different plates appear of the uh, globe, um, how they uh, move. They move apart from one another. Some of them move closer to one another. Um, every time they run into one another, you have an earthquake. Um, and then you can see where the plates are found at, um, and then you can see how they move apart if you want to look this up. Uh, I'll probably post a video on plate tectonics on the supplemental video page, and then you can watch these uh, plates move apart. So you can see here Pangaea, um, our supercontinent. Um, you can watch it break apart. All the animals were able to um, intermingle here, watch it break apart um, into our modern day um, dispersed uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, globe that we have today. So the Wallace line. Um, this is uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, the uh, other guy that came up with the theory of evolution at the exact same time as Charles Darwin. Um, and essentially what this is, is it's this concept here. Um, the little line that's going to be drawn right here. That's going to separate uh, old world from new world organisms. And essentially in that idea, um, organisms that evolved on the um, East Asian, um, Asiatic species on the um, these plates right in here, Asia, Europe, um, Africa. Um, and then the organisms that evolved on the Australia, North America, South America plate. Um, they're going to be different. Um, and that's essentially what the Wallace line looks at. Um, it's drawn right around um, Borneo, uh, Australia, and it essentially goes up um, through, through Japan and things like that, um, right around in here. Um, and that's where the barrier um, for those old and new world organisms um, is drawn. A very interesting uh, thing to see, and you can see all the organisms on this side are very similar to one another, and all the other organisms on the other side are also very similar to one another. Another thing that we can talk about um, to prop up the theory of evolution are things called homologous structures. And this has to do with how organisms are put together on an anatomical level. So you can see here, um, homologous structures um, are structures that are shared between species 
um, because those species share a common ancestor um, at one point in time. So mammals, pretty much every single mammal on the planet is going to have an arm that is going to be identical to one another. Bat arms, whale arms, cat arms, human arms, they all look drastically different, but they all have the exact same bone structures inside of them for the most part. Humerus, 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 you can see they've colored them the same. Radius ulna, you can see them here. Um, you can see the carpals, the metacarpals, the uh, phalanges down here, the finger joints. They're all in the same place in the same order. The more interesting idea behind this um, is that these homologous structures, these different types of bones, uh, humerus and things, all arise from the same um, embryonic um, DNA um, genetic code in these organisms. Um, so a humerus, the gene for making a humerus in a human, is the exact same gene for making a humerus in a cat, um, the same in a whale, and the same in a bat. Um, you can actually take the genes from bats and put them in whales, put the whale from genes, uh, uh, the gene from a whale into a bat that makes a humerus, um, and they will both make appropriately sized humeruses that function for one another. Um, very interesting. Those genes are that similar to one another. Um, and the reason for that. I and mean, why they are uh, produced from the same genetic origins. They have, uh, are produced from the same embryonic tissues. Um, they even have the same numbers of bones. They just look a little different. They're evolved a little different to specialize for the organism's particular environment. You can see this one's evolved for flight, swimming, running, um, using it as an arm for uh, manipulating things. But regardless um, what they do, um, how they look, they're all the same evolutionary origin, the same bones, they come from the same embryonic tissue, they come from the same genetic information. Um, and the reason for that is at one point in time, there was a mammal on the planet that essentially gave rise to all of the different types of mammals that we see today. Um, uh, evolution, as I mentioned, works kind of like a, a stumbling through the dark with your eyes shut. Um, it just makes something that works. It's not something that's great. Um, so once the arm structure kind of had been worked out through trial and error with evolution, something worked. We got an organism that had a decently functional arm. Um, that decently functional arm was then what the formula was going to be used from then on out. That organism would reproduce with other decently functional arms. That decently functional arm was then progressed um, and enhanced and sharpened. Um, it was never gotten rid of. It was just made a little bit better. Um, which is why we have functioning arms that fall apart, um, our bones break and things like that. We went with what worked and then we just made what worked better. Um, and all the other organisms um, got stuck with that same concept. They got stuck with the arm that worked in the very beginning um, and then as they went about their daily lives and their different environments and things like that and their different evolutionary pressures, their uh, original arm evolved set differently um, from under different pressures to um, give us the things that we see today, different looking organisms with differently structured arms, all from the same evolutionary ancestor um, due to the fact that um, that ancestor evolved a decently functioning arm that was then enhanced through evolution for different species over hundreds of millions of years. Um, so homologous structures, homo means the same, homologous means looking pretty much, um, so the way they look, structures are going to be the exact same, um, because they shared common ancestors at one point in time. Um, vestigial structures are another interesting concept of evolution. Um, vestigial structures are kind of evolutionary leftovers. I mentioned earlier the whale's pelvis. Um, at one point in time, whales had legs. They don't anymore. They won't in a couple hundred thousand years, a couple hundred million years, but they do now. Um, they're in the process of losing their pelvis. It's just not small enough to be gone yet. Um, it will essentially be gone, um, but it serves no function at the current moment. Um, it's called a vestigial structure, something that's an evolutionary leftover that apparently serves no uh, real purpose. It's just there um, because it hasn't been gotten rid of yet. It's been reduced and reduced and reduced over a couple hundred millions of years. Um, it's gotten so small um, that it serves no real purpose, and eventually it will be gotten rid of. Um, we are just in the process of losing these things, um, and eventually they will eventually be gone. We're just not there yet in our uh, evolutionary time period. So uh, the human example um, is the coccyx, 
um, the tailbone down here. It extends past your pelvis. Um, we used to have large tails. Our ancestors did. Um, we have five or six little conver uh, pressed vertebra here. Occasionally, humans can grow small little bony tails, um, which begs why would humans have the ability to grow a tail or even uh, produce these little bony tail bones um, if we never had a need for it or a use for it. Um, snakes uh, sometimes produce legs. Uh, large snakes in particular, things like boa constrictors, large uh, pythons and things always do this. Um, they used to have legs. Snakes used to have legs, which makes perfect sense. They were very lizard-like. Um, once again, we can go back to the example of the horse um, moving through the ground and things. Those legs get in the way. They get tangled up. They get snagged. Um, so having reduced legs as you slither along the ground um, would be a good idea. So essentially those legs were reduced and reduced over time um, and gotten rid of smaller and smaller and smaller. And now what they're left with is essentially just one fingernail um, that pokes out on their bottom. Um, so if you flip a male snake over or a really large uh, python and things like that, you'll see these little spurs, these leftover hind legs um, on their bodies. Um, they do have supporting bones on the inside, which is even stranger. Um, why would snakes have these um, bones inside and these little tiny knuckle joints with uh, uh, claws if they never, ever, ever had legs um, at one point in time in their evolutionary history? Very strange concept. So on the other hand, um, uh, homologous structures, we have analogous structures. So analogous structures are structures that are not um, uh, going to be arising from shared evolutionary ancestors. They're going to be arising because of the environment that these organisms live in. Um, it's going to be a similar adaptation that allows the organism to function best in the environment that it lives in. So you can see here, we have a shark, a dolphin, and an ichthyosaur. Sharks are fish. Reptiles, extinct reptiles for our ichthyosaur here. Um, and a dolphin is a mammal. So three totally different organisms here that are not related to one another. They all essentially look the exact same. They're not related to one another on an evolutionary scale at all very much. Um, but the reason they all look the same is because of the environment that they live in. They live in an aquatic environment. The environment itself is going to impact how organisms evolve. You have to be able to swim through the water. Um, and there's some ways that are better than other to swim through the water. Um, if you've ever looked at the... Um, a development of boats. There are certain shapes of boats that work really well in the water and some that don't. Um, that's why all boats pretty much look the same because some shapes work better than others. And animals work the same and so does evolution. One shape works, it's going to work well for every other animal that evolves. It has to because that's just the uh, structure of the physical environment. Evolution doesn't determine that, the physical environment does. So if you're going to live in the water, you need to be streamlined to, get, uh, to reduce the drag of the water itself. Um, you need smooth skin to be able to also reduce drag. You need some sort of large fin thing to be able to p p uh, push you through the water. You need some sort of stabilizing fins to keep you upright. Um, to keep in mind, this is a totally four-dimensional environment. You can spin, go left, right, up, down, all at once. Uh, so you need something to keep you upright, keep you straight as you move forward um, in that in aquatic environment. Now, these guys are not evolutionarily related to one another at all. Um, they look the same because the environment that they live in is the same. Different shaped tail, but it does the exact same thing as it does in the ichthyosaur, as it does in the shark. They're not evolved uh, one another. They're not related to one another very closely at all, um, but they look the same. They move the same. Their bodies are shaped essentially the same because the environment um, really only has so many shapes that work in it. And it's essentially why all fish look the same, pretty much uh, the way that their bodies are formed. Wings are another perfect example of that. Um, you have bugs, you have bats, you have birds. All those things can fly. Um, they all have wings, but their wings are no way, shape, or form um, going to be uh, related to one another on an evolutionary basis. Things with feathers, things that fly with membranes, mammals, birds are not mammals, are not related to one another. Um, their structures, their analogous structures do the same thing. Um, they're not related to one another from an evolutionary history, though. Um, same down here, you can see fins on a, a seal and fins on a, pel a penguin. Um, once again, the best thing to move through the aquatic environment happens to be a fin, which is also why we make them um, on our uh, flippers when we want to make go scuba diving. So, covergent evolution um, is the 
process that leads to those analogous structures. You live in a similar environment, you have similar evolutionary pressures, the same uh, drag from the water that everybody else has, things like that. So you're going to evolve very similar. You need a uh, flat tail um, of some sort that allows you to push yourself through the water, flat fins that allow you to get propulsion, long streamlined, smooth body, um, and things like that. So that explains why organisms that aren't really related to one another on an evolutionary uh, scale um, look very similar to one another because their environments are similar. So you can also use the development of embryos um, to support the theory of evolution as well. Um, all embryos essentially develop the same. Um, fish embryos, salamanders, um, turtles, uh, chickens, um, you can see here pig, uh, swine, uh, uh, sorry, I think that's a sheep, a cow, um, and then a human. I mean, you can see here, um, all of our embryos essentially look and develop the same way. Um, you can see here our mammals and uh, our, uh, all look the same here. Our turtles aren't a mammal, by the way, so we'll skip to here. Our mammals on this side. Um, but over here, even our turtle, a reptile, and a bird, our, the development of their embryos looks the exact same um, as it does for non-mammals uh, over here, um, as it does for mammals. They look the same. Even the intermediate stages look the same as a human. Um, pretty much looks identical to a turtle. Um, a half-developed turtle, they even look the same. They take the same body shape inside of the eggs, the, the curled in, um, and things like that. So the reason, once again, for this, why everything looks the same, is because um, it worked. Evolution hit something that worked. This shape, this way to develop a body worked. Um, it was just enhanced and changed. Um, for individual species because of the indifferent evolutionary pressures that were put on them. Um, it worked, and it was just enhanced and changed over time, which is why it looks the same. So another way to uh, support evolution is these things called Hox genes, very interesting concept. I mean, Hox genes control the layout of the body. Um, essentially, it controls where you're going to be, having arms, where your torso is going to develop, where your head's going to develop, and things like that. Now, the interesting thing about this is in every other organism on the planet, the genes are the same. The Hox gene for the arm position in humans is on the same place as the Hox gene for arm development in mice, um, as in the same in cows, and the same in cats. Um, and you can actually take that Hox gene for the development of arms from humans and swap it with a mouse. I mean, you can take the mouse gene and put it in us. Um, and we will develop fully functional human arms, and that mouse will develop fully functional mouse arms. The Hox gene just codes for the development of the arm um, and the where the uh, arm is going to be placed on the body. Um, we can change the position of the Hox genes. We can move it um, from place to place and cause an organism to grow different uh, body parts in different places of the body as well. You can see here they made a fruit fly grow antenna um, with legs instead of antenna. So very interesting things that Hox genes do. Now this is essentially um, a very interesting thing because it's the same paint palette. All the organisms on the planet essentially share the exact same genes um, for where their arms and legs are going to be positioned. You can see them here. Um, they have the exact same genes for how their bodies are going to be positioned and where they're positioned and how they're going to be put together, um, which begs the question of why would this be so similar um, if they didn't have a shared ancestor? Why would they have the same recipe um, if their ancestors weren't related to one another? Um, and then the last one is just the pure, simple fact um, that our DNA is just so similar to other ancestors around us. And you'll see here chimps, uh, bonobos and chimps are our closest living ancestor, our uh, relative. They share about 98% of their DNA in common with us. Mice have 92%, fruit flies 44, yeast 26, um, and even plants share 18% of our DNA in common with us. Now this may seem strange. Why would something like a plant share 18% DNA in common with us? Very simple answer. It's just essentially proteins um, that all organisms have that are encoded by DNA. Um, it's lipids that are made by DNA. It's going to be uh, DNA that makes something alive. <laughs> um, and that's essentially all that is. Every single organism on the planet shares around 10% of the same DNA because that's what something makes something alive. Um, that's essentially what you need. So 
um, were 10% related to bacteria, even <laughs> just because the DNA that they have makes them alive. And you kind of have to have that to make you alive. Now, the closer you go up the evolutionary time uh, scale or, 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 or uh, levels, if you like, the more complex levels towards us, the more eukaryotic, the more complex you get, the more added information you're going to get to make that base 10% more specialized to become a more uh, complex organism. Now, yeast, very simplistic single-celled eukaryote, shares 26% of their DNA in common with us. That extra 8% or so is going to be that what makes them eukaryotic. It's about all. Um, it's just going to be that extra little bit there. So fruit flies, they share 26% of their DNA in common with yeast. That extra bit's going to make them a fruit fly. And that's kind of how this works. So each time you move up the evolutionary ladder, you share the exact same percent of the DNA in common with the organisms below them. Um, it's just you take a little bit up to make you you kind of thing. So the fact that we share that much DNA in common and the proteins and genes that code for making life life and making the same proteins is all the same um, in all these organisms is a very powerful supporting uh, concept for evolution in my book. Um, why else would everything use the same recipe, use the same playbook um, if it wasn't coming from a common ancestor at one point in time? So that's pretty much all there is for this lecture, guys. Um, I hope you found this interesting, um, some of the concepts and theories um, that are used and ideas that are used to support the theory of evolution. Um, so if you have any uh, questions on this or uh, anything you'd like me to um, elaborate on a little bit, please feel free to send me an email. And if not, have a good rest of the day.